We're supposed to be the United States of America, but in many ways, we're now divided into two very different nations. There is red state America and there is blue state America. The red states favor conservative, small government, free market policies, low taxes, light regulation, tough on crime policing, and worker freedom. Think Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Arizona, and Utah. The blue states favor a liberal left, big government approach, high taxes, heavy regulations, high minimum wages, and mandatory union membership. Think New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Illinois, Oregon, and of course, California. Progressives like to argue that their big government, high tax policies are economically superior and thus better for the poor, minorities, and working class Americans than those of red states. Conservative policies, progressives contend, are culturally backward and tilted to benefit the rich. Let's test this thesis by comparing three of the largest red states, Florida, Texas, and Tennessee, with three of the largest blue states, California, New York, and Illinois. If progressive policies really work, then Americans should be rushing to get into the blue states. But just the opposite is happening. Americans are packing up their U-Hauls and heading to the red states. According to the New York Times in August 2020, so many people wanted to leave New York City that moving companies were turning away business. They just couldn't handle the demand. This exodus may be accelerating, but it's not new. Over the last decade, the three big blue states each lost an average of 1 million people to other states, while the three big red states gained almost a million from other states. Makes perfect sense. Americans like freedom. Small government means more freedom, and freedom means opportunity. Let's say you're looking for a job. Over the last decade, Florida, Texas, and Tennessee have gained twice as many jobs as the progressive states. Not only that, but your money goes further in red states. According to a 2019 Tax Foundation study, your $100 stretches to $111 in purchasing power in Tennessee, while in New Jersey, it shrinks to $89. If you're a big corporation or a small company looking for a business-friendly environment, affordable housing, or maybe just a better quality of life, where are you going to go? The tough decision is not choosing a red state or a blue state. The tough decision is which red state to move to. Progressives like to say that this isn't about economics, it's about weather. The red states tend to be in the south and southwest where the weather is warmer. But that doesn't explain why so many people are leaving California, which has the best weather in the country. So what does explain the migration from blue states? Start with taxes. The two most populous blue states, California and New York, have the highest tax rates in America, while the two most populous red states, Texas and Florida, have no income tax at all. When taxes get too high, people move to where taxes are lower. The problem for the high tax states is that these people take their money, their ambition, and their employees with them. Then there is crime. Do blue cities do better than red cities? The answer, of course, is no. Of the 20 cities with the highest murder rates, 18 are run by left-leaning Democrats, and for the most part, have been for decades. And these cities aren't getting safer, they're getting more dangerous. A good chunk of Minneapolis was burned to the ground as a result of riots following the death of George Floyd. Portland had over 90 consecutive nights of rioting, not peaceful protests, rioting. Seattle allowed an entire section of the city to declare itself an autonomous zone, a first in American history. Progressive governors, progressive mayors, progressive police chiefs run all of these cities and states. Ask any resident of Los Angeles or San Francisco about the rise in homelessness, and you'll get a litany of horror stories. Both cities, of course, have a long history of progressive mayors. How about keeping us healthy and safe? Surely the progressive states with their strict lockdowns did a better job saving lives from the coronavirus. Nope. Adjusted for population, as a resident of New York, New Jersey, or Illinois, you are three, four, or even five times more likely to die of the virus than if you lived in a red state like Florida, Texas, Georgia, Utah, or Arizona. Progressives and liberal Democrats may mean well, they certainly talk a lot about how much they care about the poor, 
minorities, and the working class. Yet somehow, it's always the poor, minorities, and the working class who pay the price for their bad policies. That's why those who can move, do move. Those who can't get stuck with the short end of the stick. Red state America is prospering. Blue state America is in meltdown. So where do you want to live? I'm Stephen Moore, economist at Freedom Works for Prager University. One of the most important differences between the left and the right is how each regards the role and the size of the government. The left believes that the state should be the most powerful force in society. Among many other things, the government should be in control of educating every child, should provide all health care, and should regulate often to the minutest detail how businesses conduct their business. In Germany, for instance, the government legislates the time of day stores have to close. In short, there should ideally be no power that competes with government. Not parents, not businesses, not private schools, not religious institutions, not even the individual human conscience. Conservatives, on the other hand, believe the government's role in society should be limited to absolute necessities, such as national defense, and to being the resource of last resort to help citizens who cannot be helped by family, by community, or by religious and secular charities. Conservatives understand that as governments grow in size and power, the following will inevitably happen. One, there will be ever-increasing amounts of corruption. Power and money breed corruption. People in government will sell government influence for personal and political gain, and people outside government will seek to buy influence and favors. In Africa and Latin America, government corruption has been the single biggest factor holding nations back from progressing. Two, individual liberty will decline. With a few exceptions, such as an unrestricted right to abortion, individual liberty is less important to the left than to the right. This is neither an opinion nor a criticism. It is simple logic. The more control the government has over people's lives, the less liberty people have. Three, countries with ever-expanding governments will either reduce the size of their government or eventually collapse economically. Every welfare state ultimately becomes a Ponzi scheme, relying on new payers to pay previous payers. And when it runs out of the new payers, the scheme collapses. All the welfare states of the world, including wealthy European countries, are already experiencing this problem to varying degrees. Four, in order to pay for an ever-expanding government, taxes are constantly increased. But at a given level of taxation, the society's wealth producers will either stop working, work less, hire fewer people, or move their business out of the state or out of the country. Five, big government produces big deficits and ever-increasing and ultimately unsustainable debt. This, too, is only logical. The more money the state hands out, the more money people will demand from the state. No recipient of free money has ever said, thank you, I have enough. Unless big governments get smaller, they will all eventually collapse under their own weight, with terrible consequences socially as well as economically. Six, the bigger the government, the greater the opportunities for doing great evil. The 20th century was the most murderous century in recorded history, and who did all this killing? Big governments. Evil individuals without power can do only so much harm. But when evil individuals take control of a big government, the amount of harm they can do is essentially unlimited. The right fears big government. The left fears big business. But Coca-Cola can't break into your house or confiscate your wealth. Only big government can do that. As irresponsible as any big business has ever been, 
It is only big government that can build concentration camps and commit genocide. Seven, big government eats away at the moral character of a nation. People no longer take care of other people. After all, they know the government will do that. That's why Americans give far more of their money and volunteer far more of their time to charity than do Europeans at the same economic level. Without the belief in an ever-expanding government, there is no left. Without a belief in limited government, there is no right. I'm Dennis Prager. A fundamental difference between left and right concerns how each assesses public policies. The right asks, does it do good? The left is more likely to ask a different question. Take the minimum wage, for example. In 1987, the New York Times editorialized against any minimum wage. The title of the editorial said it all. The right minimum wage, zero dollars and zero cents. There's a virtual consensus among economists, wrote the Times editorial, that the minimum wage is an idea whose time has passed. Raising the minimum wage by a substantial amount would price working people out of the job market. Why did the New York Times editorialize against the minimum wage? Because it asked the question, does it do good? But 27 years later, the same New York Times editorial page wrote the very opposite of what it had written in 1987 and called for a major increase in the minimum wage. In that time, the Times editorial page had moved further and further left and was now preoccupied not with the question, does it do good, but with the question, does it feel good? And it feels good to raise poor people's minimum wage. Yes. A second example is affirmative action. Study after study, and more importantly, common sense and facts, has shown the negative effects that race-based affirmative action has had on many black students. Lowering college admission standards for black applicants has ensured a number of awful results. Just to cite one, more black students fail to graduate college. Why? Because too many have been admitted to a college that demands more academic rigor than they are prepared for. Rather than attend a school that matches their academic skills, a school where they might thrive, they too often fail at the more demanding school that lowered its standards to admit them. It's clear that supporters of race-based affirmative action ask, does it feel good rather than does it do good? A third example is pacifism and other forms of peace activism. Many people on the left have a soft spot for pacifism, the belief that killing another human being is always wrong. Not all leftists are pacifists, but pacifism almost always emanates from the left and just about all leftists support peace activism, peace studies, and whatever else contains the word peace. The right, on the other hand, while just as desirous of peace as the left, what conservative parent wants their child to die in battle, knows that pacifism and most peace activists increase the chances of war, not peace. Nothing guarantees the triumph of evil like refusing to fight it. Great evil is therefore never defeated by peace activists, but by superior military might. The Allied victory in World War II is an obvious example. And violent Islamists today need to be killed before they behead, enslave, and torture more innocents. Supporters of pacifism, peace studies, American nuclear disarmament, and American military withdrawal from countries in which it has fought do not ask, does it do good? Because it almost never does good. Did the total withdrawal of America from Iraq do good? Of course not. It led to the rise of Islamic State with its mass murder and torture. Did the American withdrawal from Vietnam do good? No, it led to the violent communist takeover of South Vietnam. On the other hand, because American troops did not leave South Korea, Japan, and Germany, those countries have become three of the most prosperous and free countries 
in the world. So then, why do liberals support a higher minimum wage if it doesn't do good? Because it makes them feel good about themselves. We liberals, unlike conservatives, care about the poor. Why do liberals support race-based affirmative action? For the same reason. It makes liberals feel good about themselves. They appear to be righting the wrongs of historical racism. And the same holds true for left-wing peace activism. It's nice to think of oneself as a peace activist. All this helps to explain why young people are so much more likely to be liberal than conservative. They haven't lived long enough to really know what does good. But they do know what feels good. As society moves further and further to the left, so does the preoccupation with feeling good over doing good. The world is getting worse and worse, but many people are feeling better and better about themselves while it does. I'm Dennis Prager. The left and the right view America and its history very differently. Conservatives view America as President Abraham Lincoln viewed it, as the last best hope of Earth. While acknowledging America's flaws, conservatives regard America as the best society ever created, giving more people of more backgrounds, more freedom, more opportunity, and more affluence than any other society, and doing more good for more people in other countries than any society in history. The left, on the other hand, sees America as having been, and continuing to be, a very flawed country, morally no better than many, and morally inferior to many. The left's view is that America was founded by rich white males who were intent on protecting their race, their wealth, and in many cases, their slaves. America was and remains sexist, intolerant, xenophobic, and bigoted a country of unacceptable material inequality where the super-rich and big corporations have far too much power and influence. The further left one goes, the more negative the assessment of America. Here's a telling example. On my radio show, I once dialogued with Howard Zinn, arguably the most influential American historian of the second half of the 20th century. Here is one part of our dialogue. Professor Zinn said, if people knew history, they would scoff at the idea that the United States is a force for the betterment of humanity. When I said that America has done more good for humanity than any other country, Professor Zinn responded, America has, quote, probably done more bad than good, unquote. For the left, the moral flaws in American history are enormous, but all the unique good America has done, both in America and abroad, is minimized or ignored. Take the example of slavery. This terrible institution is the most widely cited proof of American evil. The problem with that judgment, however, is that every civilization in world history, even including African societies, practiced slavery, often on a far larger scale than America did. But there are two other questions about slavery that must be asked in order to make a moral judgment about America. The first is, which societies were the first to abolish slavery? Since all societies had slavery, that is a far more important question to ask than who had slaves. It turns out that all the societies that first abolished slavery were rooted in the Jewish and Christian Bibles, and among them was the United States. The second question that needs to be answered is this. Was America morally better than other societies in just about every other regard? And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. America gradually became the least racist, least xenophobic country in the world. In no country do people of every race and ethnicity become accepted as full members of the society as do immigrants to America. And no country in history has fought for the liberty of others as much as America has. That is why, for example, 37,000 Americans died in Korea, a country that offered America no economic gain. The purpose was to protect Koreans from communist tyranny. 
Today, South Korea, where American troops are still stationed, is one of the wealthiest and freest countries in Asia. Meanwhile, North Korea, the part of the Korean peninsula that America did not succeed in liberating, is the least free and poorest country on earth. Without America, people around the world would suffer from far more tyranny, enslavement, and genocide. The countries where American troops have remained long after their combat ceased, Germany, Japan, and South Korea, have prospered economically and morally. Countries that America abandoned, such as Vietnam and Iraq, experienced mass murder and other horrors. The left, however, views nearly all of America's wars since 1945 as expressions of superpower imperialism. Days before the 2008 American presidential election, the Democratic candidate, then-Senator Barack Obama, announced, quote, We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Exactly so. The left wants to fundamentally transform America. The right doesn't. Conservatives want to conserve America's unique greatness and improve it where necessary, but not transform it. If America is fundamentally transformed, it will not become better than other nations. It will become like other nations. I'm Dennis Prager. At the core of left-wing thought is a denial of painful realities, the denial of what the French call les faits de la vie, facts of life. Conservatives, on the other hand, are all too aware of the painful realities of life and base many of their positions on them. One example of this left-right difference is the differing attitudes toward human nature and responsibility for evil. When liberals blame violent crime on poverty, one reason they do is that ever since the Enlightenment, the left has posited that human nature is good. So then, when people do bad things to other people, the left argues that some outside forces, usually poverty, and in the case of non-white criminals, racism, are responsible, not human nature. Why? Because people on the left find it too painful to look reality in the eye and acknowledge that human nature is deeply flawed. Another fact of life that the left finds too painful to acknowledge is the existence of profound differences between men and women. There is no other explanation for the denial of what has been obvious to every previous generation in history, that men and women are inherently different. This denial is certainly not the result of scientific inquiry. The more science learns about the male brain and the female brain, not to mention male and female hormones, the more it confirms important built-in differences between the sexes. Yet many people, influenced by left-wing thought, believe that girls are as happy to play with trucks as are boys, and boys are as happy to play with dolls and tea sets as are girls. Why do they believe such silliness? Because acknowledging many of those differences is painful. For example, feminists and others on the left do not want to acknowledge that men are far more capable of having emotionally meaningless sex than women. Therefore, feminism has taught generations of young women that they are just as capable of enjoying emotionless sex with many partners as are men. The fact is that the great majority of women are deeply dissatisfied with the hookup culture and yearn to bond with a man even more than they yearn for professional success. But feminism came up with the famous and false phrase, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle, to counter the painful reality that most women feel incomplete without a man in their life, just as I might add, most men feel incomplete without a woman. Ironically, however, most men have no trouble acknowledging this. This is what the notion of political incorrectness is all about. The very definition of politically incorrect is a truth that people on the left find too painful to acknowledge and therefore do not want expressed. To cite yet another example, 
Why are many young black males in prison? The reason is too painful for the left to acknowledge, and therefore it is politically incorrect to say it. Young black males commit a disproportionate amount of violent crime. And why are there speech codes on virtually all college campuses? Because the left doesn't want to hear facts or opinions that cause them pain. That's why the left developed what it calls trigger warnings. A trigger warning, as defined by the Oxford Dictionary, is, quote, a statement at the start of a piece of writing, video, etc., alerting the reader or viewer to the fact that it contains potentially distressing material, unquote. That's why the left constantly speaks about being made uncomfortable and about feeling offended. Being made uncomfortable or feeling offended is, after all, painful. Take the left-wing bumper sticker idea, war is not the answer. The painful truth is that war is often the only answer to great evil. Nazi death camps were liberated by soldiers fighting a war, not by peace activists or by peaceful dialogue with the German regime. But having to acknowledge the moral necessity of war is too painful a truth for many on the left. One might say that leftism appeals to those who wish to remain innocent. Growing up and facing the fact that life is messy, difficult, and painful is increasingly a conservative point of view. I'm Dennis Prager. A major difference between the right and the left concerns the way each seeks to improve society. Conservatives believe that the way to a better society is almost always through the moral improvement of the individual, by each person doing battle with his or her own weaknesses and flaws. It is true that in violent and evil societies such as fascist, communist, or Islamist tyrannies, the individual must be preoccupied with battling outside forces. Almost everywhere else, though, certainly in a free and decent country such as America, the greatest battle of the individual must be with inner forces, that is, with his or her moral failings. The left, on the other hand, believes that the way to a better society is almost always through doing battle with society's moral failings. Thus, in America, the left concentrates its efforts on combating sexism, racism, intolerance, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, and the many other evils that the left believes permeate American society. One important consequence of this left-right distinction is that those on the left are far more preoccupied with politics than those on the right. Since the left is so much more interested in fixing society than in fixing the individual, politics inevitably becomes the vehicle for societal improvement. That's why whenever the term activist is used, we almost always assume that the term refers to someone on the left. Another consequence of this left-right difference is that since conservatives believe society has changed one person at a time, they accept that change happens gradually. This isn't fast enough for the left, which is always and everywhere focused on social revolution. An excellent example of this was a statement by the then presidential candidate Barack Obama just days before his first election in 2008. To a rapturous audience, he declared, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Conservatives not only have no interest in fundamentally transforming the United States of America, they are strongly opposed to doing so. Conservatives understand that fundamentally transforming any society that isn't fundamentally bad, not to mention transforming what is one of the most decent societies in history, can only make the society worse. Conservatives believe that America can be improved, but should not be transformed, let alone fundamentally transformed. The founders of the United States recognized that the transformation that every generation must work on is the moral transformation of each citizen. 
Thus, character development was at the core of both child rearing and of young people's education from elementary school through college. As John Adams, the second president, said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And in the words of Benjamin Franklin, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. Why is that? Because freedom requires self-control. The freer the society, the more self-control is necessary. If the majority of people don't control themselves, the state, meaning an ever more powerful government, will have to control them. From the founding of the United States until the 1960s, schools and parents concentrated on character education. But with the ascent of left-wing ideas, character education has all but disappeared from American schools. Instead, children are taught not to focus on their flaws, but on America's. Social issues have replaced character education. An example is a new K-12 science curriculum, the next generation of science standards, which will teach young Americans starting in kindergarten about global warming. And when they get to college, American young people will be taught about the need to fight economic inequality, white privilege, and the alleged rape culture on their campuses. Ironically, if there really is a rape culture that permeates American college campuses, the only reason would have to be that there was so little character education in our schools, or for that matter, at home. Fathers and religion, historically the two primary conveyors of self-control, are non-existent in the lives of millions of American children. We are now producing vast numbers of Americans who are passionate about fixing America while doing next to nothing about fixing their own character. The problem, however, is that you can't make society better unless you first make its people better. I'm Dennis Prager. Why does the left hate Israel? On the surface, it doesn't make sense. Israel is a liberal democracy. It extends full rights to women, to gays, and to its many Arab citizens. Like all countries which are made up of flawed human beings, Israel is flawed. But compared to most countries, not to mention its neighbors, it is a civil rights paradise. So why does the left hate Israel? The reason is that the left, and as I always emphasize, I am talking about the left, not about liberals, is not guided by a moral compass. It is guided by three other compasses, a power compass, a race compass, and a class compass. Let's begin with the power compass. Instead of evaluating people and nations on the basis of right and wrong or good and evil, the left evaluates them on the basis of weak and strong. If you're weak, you're good. If you're strong, you're bad. Israel is strong, therefore it is bad. America is strong, therefore it is bad. The Palestinians are regarded as weak, therefore they're good. When you're guided by a moral compass, you don't ask who's strong and who's weak. You ask who's morally right and who's morally wrong. Fifty years ago, Israel was not a big issue for the left. Why? Because it was perceived as weak. But after the 1967 Six-Day War, in which Israel achieved a stunning military victory, it all changed. Israel became strong, so Israel became bad. And the Palestinians were weak, so they became good. So no matter how much terror Palestinians engaged in, hijacking airplanes, murdering 11 Israeli athletes and coaches at the 1972 Munich Olympics, blowing up Israelis in pizza parlors and at weddings, the left's position never changed. Palestinians good, Israel bad, because the Palestinians were weak and Israel was strong. That's one of the three ways the left judges the world. You can test this theory in other ways. Why is the United States bad? Because it's strong. 
and third world countries that oppose the United States are good. Cuba, for example, has been adored by the left for decades. Never mind that Cuba's Communist Party has ruined Cuba, that Cubans have no civil rights, and Cuba is one of the poorest countries in the world. Since Cuba is weak, to the left, Cuba is good. The same was true with North Vietnam in the 1960s. It was considered weak, so it was good. The U.S. was strong, so it was bad. It didn't matter that America was trying to preserve the freedom of the South Vietnamese exactly as it had preserved the freedom of the South Koreans. The U.S. was strong, so it was bad. Which brings us back to Israel. The stronger Israel gets, as it effectively defends itself, as its economy grows, and as its diplomatic position improves, the more the left hates it. The second of the left's compasses, the race compass, is another reason the left hates Israel. Just as it substitutes weak and strong for good and evil, the left substitutes non-white and white for good and evil. The left doesn't judge people by their actions, but by their race. That's why, for example, the left asserts that a black person cannot be a racist. Only a white person can be a racist. And that provides the second reason Israel is labeled evil. Israelis are considered white, and Palestinians are not white. Never mind that more than half of Israel's population is not white. The result? The left essentially ignores Palestinian terror and loudly condemns Israel's responses to terror. Now to the left's third compass, the class compass. This is the third way in which the left replaces traditional Western and Judeo-Christian categories of good and evil. Instead of judging people's actions by the same moral yardstick, that of good and evil, the left judges people's actions based on their economic class. Rich people and rich nations are bad. Poor people and poor nations are good. This began with Karl Marx, who divided the world by economic class, not moral behavior. To Marx and to Marxism, good and evil is entirely class-based. Good is defined as workers, evil as owners. And that is the third reason for the left's hatred of Israel and of America. They are both wealthy. As fewer and fewer people perceive the world in terms of good and evil, Substituting a power, race, or class compass for a moral compass, you will inevitably get more evil and more hatred of the good, beginning with Israel and America and ending with Western civilization. I'm Dennis Prager. Did you know that all success in life is based on conservative principles? Well, it's true. As I explain in my book, how to be right, the art of being persuasively correct, if liberals applied their no score, no winner, no loser belief systems to their hobbies or professions, they would fail miserably. Success relies on absolute truths, on supply and demand, on work and reward, on competition, and on achievement, not group identity. As the old saying goes, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. Conservatives catch mice, liberals buy them cheese, with your money. It's interesting that people who participate in professions that require conservative values are so often on the left. Here are three examples you might not have thought of. Example one, the musician. You'd think all of them are liberals in their personal lives, but only a few can actually afford to be. Smart musicians are often the most conservative people on the planet. Someone has to pay for the gas, the guitar strings, and the antibiotics. When you see your favorite metal band, you can bet that the whole tour is mapped out not as some hippy-dippy road trip, but as a meticulously planned endeavor to wring every penny of profit out of it. Maybe it's not surprising then that the most successful rock band in history is headed by someone who studied finance and accounting at the London School of Economics, Mick Jagger. And yes, it's true, satisfaction was about the joy of capital gains. Example two, fitness. As a former editor of a health magazine, I can attest the government cannot give you six pack abs unless you get them to pay for the implants. Exercise is perhaps the best example of conservative thinking at your disposal. 
For the amount of effort you put in, you reap the reward you deserve. If you pump iron for two hours, three times a week, your body will change as a direct result. Fitness is one bank where you deposit effort and you build a portfolio of reward. There is no affirmative action in exercise. One muscle doesn't get special dispensation because it's smaller or weaker. There is no minimum wage safety net or unemployed bennies for your glutes. You're either in shape or you're not. No one is gonna redistribute my awesome pecs. As President Barack Obama famously once said, you didn't build that. Sorry, but I did. Example three, cooking. There are boatloads of cooking shows these days populated by spiky haired women and tattooed love patched beardos from Brooklyn. They all look so Occupy Wall Street, but when they enter the kitchen, they become the wolves of Wall Street. There are no feelings behind that butcher block. There's no room for, if it feels good, do it. Restaurants that require reservations weeks or months in advance got that way because of reliance on a diligent work ethic. Everybody involved from the chef to the wait staff to dishwashers strive night in, night out to make great food and produce a great experience. You cannot reach that pinnacle without being intensely competitive and results oriented. In other words, a capitalist. In the end, cooking is really just building a successful enterprise with food. And it must taste good, not fulfill a greater good. All success in life is based on conservative principles. Ponder that the next time you hear a great piece of music, hit the gym, or eat a tasty meal. If you do, you might realize you're not as liberal as you think. I'm Greg Gutfeld. What's the difference between a liberal and a leftist? This question stumps most people because they think liberal and left are essentially the same. But they're not. In fact, liberalism and leftism have almost nothing in common. But the left has appropriated the word liberal so effectively, almost everyone, liberals, leftists, and conservatives, thinks they are synonymous. But they're not. Let me offer you six examples. One, race. This is probably the most obvious difference between liberal and left. The liberal position on race has always been, A, the color of a person's skin is insignificant, and B, those who believe race is significant are racists. Meanwhile, the left believes the very opposite. To the left, it's the liberal attitude toward race. It's unimportant. That is racist. That's why the University of California officially lists the statement, there is only one race, the human race, as racist. And liberals have always been passionately committed to racial integration, while the left is increasingly committed to racial segregation, such as all black dormitories and separate black graduations at universities. Two, capitalism. Liberals have always been pro-capitalism because liberals are committed to free enterprise and because they know capitalism is the only way to lift great numbers of people out of poverty. It is true that liberals want government to play a bigger role in the economy than conservatives do. But liberals never opposed capitalism, and they were never for socialism. Opposition to capitalism and advocacy of socialism are left-wing values. Three, nationalism. Liberals believe in the nation-state, whether that nation is the United States, Brazil, or France. But because the left divides the world by class rather than by national identity, the left has always opposed nationalism. So, while liberals have always wanted to protect American sovereignty and borders, the left is for open borders. When the writers of Superman were liberals, Superman was a proud American whose very motto was truth, justice, and the American way. But that all changed a few years ago when left-wing writers took over the comic strip and had Superman renounce his American citizenship to be a citizen of the world. The left has contempt for nationalism, seeing it as the road to fascism. Better that we should all be citizens of the world in a world without borders. Four, view of America. Liberals have always venerated America. Watch American films from the 1930s through the 1950s 
and you will be watching overtly patriotic America celebrating films, virtually all produced, directed, and acted by liberals. Liberals were quite aware of America's imperfections, but they agreed with Abraham Lincoln that America is the last best hope of Earth. The left, however, believes the left is the last best hope of Earth and regards America as racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, violent, and imperialistic. 5. Free Speech No one has been more committed than American liberals to the famous statement, I wholly disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. But the left is leading the first widespread suppression of free speech in modern American history. From the universities, to the tech companies that govern the internet, to almost every other institution and place of work. Of course, the left claims to only oppose hate speech. But putting aside the fact that the left deems hate speech anything it differs with, protecting what you or I might consider hate speech is the entire point of free speech. 6. Western Civilization Liberals have always championed and sought to protect Western civilization. Liberals celebrate the West's unique moral, philosophical, artistic, musical, and literary achievements, and have taught them at virtually every university. The most revered liberal in American political history, President Franklin Roosevelt, often cited the need to protect Western civilization and even Christian civilization. Yet when President Donald Trump spoke of the need to protect Western civilization in a speech in Warsaw, the left-wing media, also known as the mainstream media, denounced him. They argued that Western civilization is no better than any other and that Western civilization is just a euphemism for white supremacy. So then, if liberalism and leftism are so different, why don't liberals oppose the left? In a nutshell, because they have been taught all their lives to fear the right. But as one of the best-known liberals in America, Harvard Law School professor Alan Dershowitz said, As a liberal, as an American, and as a Jew, I far more fear the left than the right. Dear liberals, conservatives are not your enemy. The left is. I'm Dennis Prager. I wouldn't be caught dead at a Donald Trump rally. I mean, come on, I've given money to Bernie. And yet there I was, February 2020, listening to the President of the United States address a crowd of 11,000 supporters. How in the world did that happen? Well, it all started with knitting. I knit to relax, to escape the drama of real life. But like almost everything nowadays, even knitting has become political to the point that only those with politically correct views are welcome in the online knitting forums. You think I'm kidding. I wish I were, but I'm not. The online knitting mob is real, and like all mobs, it's mean. That always made me uncomfortable, the insults and the name calling, but I despised those knuckle-dragging Republicans as much as the next knitter. So despite my discomfort, I never gave it much thought. Truth is, I'm more interested in mastering a three-needle bind-off than discussing immigration policy. But the knitting mob wouldn't drop it. It became a fixation, a daily litany of how horrible the president and his followers were. It started to bug me. All I wanted to do was knit. But then I began to wonder, could those Trump supporters, some of whom were literally my neighbors, really be as irredeemable as they said? I assumed the answer was yes, but I had to find out. And that is how I came to be at a rally for the president on the eve of the New Hampshire primary. My friends urged me not to go. They feared for my safety. One offered me her pepper spray for protection. I declined, but I won't pretend I wasn't nervous. I had no idea what to expect. I arrived four hours early. The line outside the arena was already a mile long. At first, I said nothing to those around me. I didn't want to provoke a scene, but then as people are wont to do when stuck in a long line, we started to chat. First pleasantries, and then to more serious topics. And here's what I discovered. These people were so nice. No one harassed me, no one intimidated me, no one threatened me. In fact, when I mentioned I was a Democrat, their response was invariably a smile 
and welcome. These were decent, hardworking people from every walk of life. Electricians, lawyers, school teachers, small business owners, veterans. I might question some of the policies they supported. They were only too happy to debate me. But I couldn't question their good intentions or decency. Inside, the atmosphere was electric, more like a rock concert than a political event. People were dancing and having a fantastic time. They were actually enjoying themselves. As it happens, two days earlier, I had been in this same arena for a Democratic Party rally. The contrast was stark. Whereas the event for the president was full of optimism and enthusiasm, the Democrats' event was all doom and gloom. The country was racked with racism, sexism, and xenophobia. At the Trump event, the participants were bursting with national pride. Of course the president touted his achievements, especially the economy, and attacked his opponents. But I was surprised how funny he was, and his energy never flagged. He seemed to be enjoying the event every bit as much as his audience. Here's something else that surprised me. While the crowd had obvious affection for the country's chief executive, there was nothing slavish or mindless about it. These people were not stupid, not brainwashed, and, as far as I could tell, not racist, sexist, or phobic anything. So, did going to a Trump rally change me? Well, my values are the same, but my perspective is different. I'll even say the experience made me a better person. I learned that the people who come to these rallies aren't there because they hate anybody. They're there because they love America. Somewhere between Pearl 1, Knit 2, I had lost that love. Now I have it again, and I'm grateful. The rally also reminded me that we are a people. Yes, we have fierce disagreements on how to solve our problems, but those who differ with us are not evil. Thinking that they are, that's the problem. That's what's tearing us apart. I refuse to add to the divisiveness any longer. I refuse to hate people I don't know simply because I don't like the way they vote. I invite you to join me. Let's make America civil again. If we can do that, we'll all win. I'm Carlin Borisenko, independent voter for Prager University. Tolerance. It's a word we hear a lot these days, so let's define it. Tolerance is the ability to live with people whose opinions and behavior you don't agree with. That's essentially how Oxford defines it, how Merriam-Webster defines it, and how we as a society have always defined it. You might be for the death penalty and your cousin might be against it. You might be against a $15 minimum wage and your coworker might be for it. Your dad might have voted for Trump, your mom might have voted for Clinton, and your brother may not have voted at all. Whatever differences we have, tolerating others' opinions is a prerequisite to a functioning and free society. America itself was built on a foundation of tolerance. The Declaration of Independence guarantees us life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But there's an implicit contract there. To have your life, your liberty, and your pursuit of happiness, you have to be tolerant of somebody else's life, their liberty, and their pursuit of happiness. This contract, though, seems to be breaking down. If you listen to the mainstream media, only one side is living up to this deal. The left. The right, according to the media, is intolerant of everyone except those darned white heterosexual Christian males. There's only one problem. It's just not true. Incredibly, the left isn't even tolerant of the very people they say they're tolerant of. If you're gay or black or an immigrant and you're not in lockstep with current leftist orthodoxy, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you believe we should judge people on the content of their character and not the color of their skin, the left calls you racist. If you believe that America is a nation of immigrants, but that our country should also protect its borders, the left calls you a xenophobe. If you believe that men and women are equal but fundamentally different, the left calls you sexist. Here's the thing, those who only tolerate people they agree with or like aren't actually tolerant. So who is tolerant? Is it the organizers of the Women's March who had to apologize for the hurt and confusion they caused when they invited a man, leftist icon Bernie Sanders, to speak at their convention? Is it the Antifa thugs who caused UC Berkeley to spend $600,000 on security 
when mainstream conservative Ben Shapiro showed up to give a talk? Or is it Democratic Congresswoman Maxine Waters who scolded Kanye West for talking out of turn when he dared suggest that blacks should think for themselves? These aren't isolated examples. I'm guessing that you, person watching this right now, have silenced yourself because you don't want to suffer the wrath of the outrage mob. So let me ask the question again. Who is tolerant? Well, here's the surprise. It's actually those scary right-wingers that the media and the universities demonize every day. I speak from personal experience. Maybe I'm a glutton for punishment here, but I still consider myself a liberal. And it's my duty as a liberal to say what I think. I would rather stand for what I believe and be hated than bow down and be loved. The left, sadly, has become utterly intolerant of anyone with whom they disagree. Why? Because they believe that they know how you should live and how you should think. Any deviation, any nonconformity is dangerous to that goal. Believe it or not, the right these days actually welcomes diversity of thought. I can tell you that in the last few years of my political evolution, I've consistently found conservatives to be tolerant and open-minded. Don't take my word for it, though. Test it out for yourself. Go talk to some. They do exist, and they do things like watch movies, travel, and eat ethnic food. You know, regular people things. You know what I found out? The right, much more than the left, believes in the notion of live and let live. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the true definition of tolerance. I'm Dave Rubin of The Rubin Report for Prager University. There are crazy positions on the far left and crazy positions on the far right. On the left, there are people who believe a man can get pregnant, that the world is going to end in a decade if we don't cap carbon emissions, that the real purpose of the American Revolution was to preserve slavery. On the right, there are people who deny the Holocaust happened, who believe that whites are inherently superior to other races, that no one should pay taxes. But there's an important difference between these two extremes. The crazies on the right have no voice. They are shunned. They live mostly on the far fringes of the internet. The crazies on the left have a loud voice. They are celebrated. They live in the halls of Congress, in state legislatures, and in governor's mansions. In light of this distinction, it might be interesting to ask ourselves this question. Which group, the left or the right, is more radical? We can arrive at a common sense answer by posing this thought experiment. What would America look like if the left got everything it wanted, and what would America look like if the right got everything it wanted? Let's start with the left. Taxes would go up on individuals and corporations to pay for more social programs. Everything from universal childcare to free college tuition. Many on the left call for income taxes as high as 70%. Private health insurance would be abolished. The government would provide all healthcare services. Everyone in the medical field, from doctors, nurses, and administrators, would be government employees. Americans would pay for this government healthcare through much higher taxes. Illegal immigration would be decriminalized. It would still be illegal to enter the country without proper documentation, but no one who made it into the U.S. would be prosecuted for doing so. Illegal immigrants would also receive free health care, free education, and free housing. The Green New Deal would be adopted. Hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies for wind and solar power would be added to the federal budget. Drilling for fossil fuels, the current source of 80% of our energy, would be sharply curtailed or eliminated altogether. So would nuclear power. As a result, consumers' electric bills would be much higher. Reparations would be paid for the past injustice of slavery. How it would be paid and exactly to whom is not clear. Legally acquiring a gun would become much more difficult. College debt would be canceled. Those who had already paid for college would get nothing. Transgender women, biological men who identify as women, would be allowed to compete against women in sports. America's military budget would be slashed by 25 to 50 percent. Speech codes would be enforced throughout American life. And that's just a partial list. Now let's ask what would happen if the right got what it wanted. Income taxes would be cut. Capital gains taxes would be cut. Corporate taxes would be cut. And those cuts would be made permanent. All regulations that make doing business unnecessarily difficult 
and don't protect public health would be repealed. The issue of abortion would be sent back to the states for each state to decide its own abortion rules for itself. Many more charter schools would be opened, and it would become much easier to fire bad teachers. In order to vote, citizens would need to present a valid ID. The border with Mexico would be secured. The only way to enter the United States would be through designated border crossings. In order to qualify for welfare assistance, you would have to prove you could not work. The healthcare system would be open to free market reforms. For example, insurance companies could sell policies across state lines. Students in elementary school would recite the Pledge of Allegiance at the start of each school day. So what can we conclude from our experiment? It's not hard to figure out. If the right got everything it wanted, the government would get much smaller, the citizen would have more freedom. If the left got everything it wanted, the government would get much bigger, the citizen would have less freedom. You're not radical if you want America to be what it's always been, committed to individual liberty. You're only radical if you want to fundamentally transform America into something it's never been. Which country do you want to live in? I'm Will Witt for Prager University.